that. And now, what we've all been waiting for, I am going to turn it over to our amazing presenter today. We have Ali Schwenke from Simple Strat Marketing. Marketing. Awesome. And Ali, I'll let you go ahead and take over the screen. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, you sound good. Awesome, all right, well let's get this in presentation mode. Okay, you see that all right? Looks good. Yes, okay, fantastic. All right, well thanks everybody for uh, joining me today. I am super excited to talk about marketing hacks. Um, if anybody has uh, met me in person or watched any of my stuff online, um, I tend to get really excited and talk really fast. <laughs> so if I, if I tend to run things over, we have the chat pane open, so please use that. Um, I have a coworker here with me, Emma Urbanic. She was also uh, involved in setting this up, so she's gonna help facilitate some of that as well as Heidi. So thanks you guys uh, for standing by and doing that. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, move forward here. All right, so the objectives for today are to, um, so one of the hacks that we definitely wanted to hone in on is how to set, segment your audience for better results. Because people will ask me, you know, hey, how do I use Facebook to better market my business? And those are really, um, like the answer to a lot of those questions are it depends. So I end up sending some sort of psychologist because it's really hard to give people a straight, like silver bullet type of answer because they're not um, targeting the right audience. We're gonna talk through that. Um, definitely what everyone's here for today, which is free or low cost tools. The two words that are like magic to a small business owner's ears. Is it free or low cost? Boom, I'm in. Um, so you want to leverage your time and your budget. Now the caveat with that also is you know, even though sometimes they're free, uh, it still costs your time. So we'll talk through, you know, how you can best use your time as well. And then digging into basic analytics of data to make better decisions. Decision. So, um, you know, if you haven't been introduced to the idea of quote unquote big data, uh, there's still a lot of conversation around that and it just continues to build. So even though you have a Facebook page and you have, let's say, you know, 500 fans, how do I analyze the basics of the engagement to know how to make decisions with that? So um, we have a whole different uh, type of, of webinar that we would go through relative to metrics. So if anybody's interested in specific metric driven conversations, uh, you know, drop us a note or, or shoot us a, a, you know, tweet us or whatever, because um, we can get you into that content, which would go much more in depth than we'll cover today. All right. So what's on your mind? What I'd like to gather real quick here, anytime we do, you know, a webinar or or a presentation, if any of you happen to be at the Market Tech event, we did a couple presentations there, our team did, and always wanna find out who we're talking to, what's gonna make the most sense, because at the end of these uh, 45 minutes, essentially, I want people to walk away with, uh, you know, that was great, it was relevant to me and helpful to me, and, and I got something out of that. So if you're on the chat pane, if you wouldn't mind just uh, chiming in right now and, uh, and saying you know, what you hope to get out of this webinar today so we can make sure that we deliver the best content to you. So the chat pane's open, feel free to drop a couple of notes in there and we can, uh, we can help frame this conversation for you. And if you are the, the type that likes to tweet, um, the uh, Grow Nebraska as well as our uh, Twitter accounts down at the end of every slide, so. Oh, Kate's a fan, <laughs> hey Kate. Uh, thanks for joining us, love for you to follow on. Uh, let's see, creating YouTube videos has been a challenge. Um, quickly upload a video to edit in Adobe Spark. Oh, you're, you're editing Adobe Spark, that's awesome. Quick tips in editing videos. Okay, I know Emma on our team uses uh, Spark a lot to edit our videos. Um, when and what content is the best for social marketing? Um, Casey, if you wouldn't mind adding in what business you're in, what type of company you have, that will be helpful in answering that question. Uh, continue to add those those chats in there and we'll we'll dive back into those during some Q&A at the end as well But if we get to a certain slide that you have a question on feel free to chime in uh, on the chat specific uh, To that that topic. So real quick about simple strat. We are a marketing agency. We're based in Lincoln, Nebraska uh, But we work with clients from all over so the uh, the types of services that we have are listed there but uh, you know ideally what we're 
uh, focused on is helping companies grow. And when we say growth, uh, Grow Nebraska, it's a great synergy. So love that in your name, obviously, uh, as the Grow Nebraska fans that we are. But the growth in uh, sales and revenue and leads, sometimes growth simply means growth in market awareness or reach or impressions. So uh, status quo is not typically uh, something that we're a fan of, you know, maintaining and just doing what you always did. So we do challenge people to get outside uh, of their box and think. And sometimes growth, especially when you're a new business owner, growth might mean growing in your understanding of marketing. And that's okay. So if, uh, again, if anything today needs clarified, please feel free to raise your hand virtually and we'll dig into it. All right, a couple other things we got here in the chat pane. Uh, Instagram encouraged college students to shop our store. Cool, we'll dug into some Instagram tips. Um, <laughs> you're right, picture is worth a thousand words, but what's gonna make people, people act? Uh, how to get more sales and present venues? Good, okay, all good stuff we'll cover uh, here today. So the first focus area we're gonna dive into is selling and marketing to the right people. So this is where that uh, conversation of finding that right audience is going to be relevant. Now, real quick, in the chat pane, I'd like everybody to um, you know, let us know, do you currently segment your audience into different, uh, you know, based on characteristics? Do you have uh, demographic segmentation or psychographic, like values-based or geography? Um, you know, real quick, just let me know, is there a segmentation? If there is, how do you do it? And if not, that's okay, just say, you know, no, we currently have one big list. So if you happen to be at uh, the content session at Market Tech, we did talk about uh, building personas. And personas is the way that we prefer to talk about segmentation. And even though the word segmentation sounds pretty clinical, I want everyone to just kind of toss that out and think, you know, me, so I'll, I'll tell you a bit about me. Um, I am a mom, I'm a business owner, I have two boys. Um, so by all accounts, demographically, I'm a boy's mom, but because, uh, because I'm a business owner as well, I'm tied on time and I am a horrible, even though my boys love to eat, I can't cook to save my life. So, you know, if you were targeting something that would be this amazing gourmet dinner that, you know, I could make as a mother, I'd be like, can I make it in a crock pot? And can I, you know, have my, my nanny make it as well? Um, so different things that me as a persona is not going to look like the same target audience as everyone else. So we have your typical target audience here, which is what we find most people start with. So they'll say, my target audience is females, age 30 to 45, uh, they like to travel, married with one or two kids. When we talk about a buyer persona, this allows us to segment much better, which is where the hack comes in. So we're talking marketing hacks today. And when we talk about the personas, if I were to go, so back to uh, that question about college students and Instagram, when I'm looking at the buyer personas of a college student, you're gonna have different types of college students, not just everyone being the same. So your personas might be, you know, college student who happens to be a female who's very into fashion and supporting her local university. You have a different college student who's all about, you know, organic and sustainability and recycled goods. And that person would respond to something much different than the person that would respond to the university apparel, regardless of where it's made or created. And that might be, you know, China or Taiwan. So the buyer persona helps us uh, dial into and segment according to behaviors and preferences. So in this example, we have traveling Terry, who's 40 years old. She travels twice per year. She's married with two kids. So again, that same demographic information that was over on the left, then we, we flesh this out a little bit more on the right. And we say, you know, feels like traveling keeps her young while bringing her family together. And then struggles to find kid from the activities that her and her husband also enjoy. Now, what we find interesting in segmentation is, think about your audience right now. If you were to say, yeah, okay, I have different, I have different segments within my target audience, um, and I think they're this. The key to really segmenting your audience is talking to them. So how would we find out that traveling Terry feels like travel keeps her young? We'd probably have to talk to her. I almost guarantee you that's a phrase that she says when she's talking about travel. We find this to be true when we're talking to even our clients. Um, my, my team knows that I have a file in Evernote called Things Business Owners Say in Meetings. Because when they say things like, I don't even know what I should be measuring in my marketing program. That is a much different phrase than the top 10 marketing metrics every business owner should know. Like those are both good titles. But the first one was words that he actually or she actually used versus what I put in their mouth. 
So to even get started creating buyer personas, we want to have, you know, what are you in charge of or expecting to manage? Uh, those are, these are questions that you want to be asking your target audience. So these are relative to business to business. Now, um, you know, for the, uh, for Tom, when you're talking about college students, you might ask them like, you know, what are the things that you find that you're doing throughout the day? So you might be finding that this, you know, the college students you're targeting uh, have three jobs and it's hard for them to get to a brick and mortar location to buy something they'd much rather comment on Instagram and purchase through direct message. Again, I don't know if that's true, but um, asking them this question, um, you know, what are your top three goals? If you're doing business to consumer or business to uh, like buying uh, a good versus buying a service as a business, um, the, the question might be something more like, you know, what are things that make you happy? You know, how do you run, how do you go about doing your day? What's important to you uh, in life? So all these questions here, we won't walk through each one of them because we have a lot of hacks to get through today. But um, all of these here, and uh, you know, we'll share the slide deck after this if you want to take these. But when we do buyer persona segmentation, we want to ask these questions of our top customers. So if you don't know where to start right now, and this is a little bit like, you know, I want to do segmentation, but I'm not sure where to start. Pick three to five of your best customers and ones that work with the company, not just because you guys are friends and went to high school together, but they work with your company and they're a fan of your goods and your services and ask them questions that help you better understand and then build out those personas uh, for your company. So here's an example of a persona from real life. Um, this is a snappy Sam. And this is how we use this. And this is what guides your marketing and then makes all these other hacks that we're going to talk about today much more effective. So snappy Sam, she's, he's a young owner, about 35. Right here, this fourth one prefers emails and texts. This is a really big deal because if they prefer email and texts, are they going to be open to a campaign where you're calling directly and bothering them during the day? Probably not. Um, they have need to have versus nice to haves. So when the, when the copy in your Facebook ads or the copy in your email messages needs to align with what these people are thinking about, um, these goals and challenges are important because they help you figure out how best to use either um, aspirational copy or fear as a motivation. All the psychology involved in marketing hacks um, come from this type of approach. And we like to use alliteration because it makes it fun to remember. So even like at the agency, one of our personas is uh, Modern Leader Mark. And when, anytime I say Modern Leader Mark inside the company, all of my team knows exactly what type of person I'm talking about and what he thinks and knows and does, and it really streamlines our ability to target them. So our first hack here as we dive into segmentation is stating your hypothesis. So this is, um, as a small business owner, you might say, uh, you know, my, hop, my pot, hypothesis is that um, I believe, so let's, let's take that printing company, the lips printing, uh, that was the sponsor as an example. The hypothesis might be, uh, business owners want to be able to have a, uh, a way to upload their files so that they don't have to talk to a printing sales rep. That's the hypothesis. So instead of actually creating that, you can create, let's say it's a, you know, a landing page or a simple Google forum that says, Hey, we've created this and then go out and talk to the customers and say, here's what we're thinking make your life easier. Is this in fact a problem? If it is, how do we make this easier on you? And what's more, you know, what's important to you in your job? What do you value? So really talking to your customers, using those questions, testing and verifying, that's going to be the first thing you need to do to make all these other hacks work. Okay. We can talk about segmentation and audience and personas all day long, but um, we might get really research and clinical there. So we're going to go right to the, to the hacking here. So hacking ensues. All right, so the next hack here we have is write long content. If anybody's blogging, the, so I'll, I'll have business owners say, um, isn't blogging the way that you get more SEO? And I'll say, yes, it is with, with a caveat. So this graph here that sourced from neopatel.com, which is from Serp by Key, which is a software, um, it basically shows the top 10 results on a Google page. So imagine that you typed in um, I don't know, how to write a marketing plan. The first 10 results that you would see on this page are, um, I guess, summarized in the way that it would appear. So you have results one through 10, and you see that this, the second result here has about 2,450 words. And you see this continue to go down as the search results um, continue to go down the page. So the, the lesson here is if you're going to blog and you're going to put out content that people really want to interact with, 
go all in. Otherwise you end up looking like everybody else. So if you have a blog post, it's like, um, you know, the three ways you can save time using software X, Y, Z. And it's like, I don't know if you guys have ever had this where you, you look at an article and you think you want to, you want to click into it. And then it's like, Oh, I've already read that four different places. If you're going to create content, create long content, not only does it help you um, appear in the search results, but it also better serves your customers. The other thing that long content does on your website, it tells Google that someone's enjoying that and having time spent on page. So it's like, a, it's called dwell time. So when dwell time is longer, the signal that it gives to search engines is that, you know what, that viewer found what they were looking for and it was helpful. Therefore, I'm going to serve this content up more often. So something to keep your eye on, uh, eye on there. All right, this one is a challenge for a lot of businesses because sometimes when we put together um, a, a blog article, it's more of like, oh my gosh, it's done. You know, or we put together a press release or whatever piece of written content you have. The, you have so many things on your plate, you're just like, I gotta get this done. But you wanna create clickable headlines. So what we have here is, uh, I wanna talk about the difference between clickable headlines and headlines with keyword copy. So the original headline, as you can see on this in the top right, is more, five more brain triggers to drive conversations on your website or landing page. So it's okay, but if they were gonna re-release this, they might change that headline and change it to one of these two things. So the things I want you to take note of here is there's some interesting words that are in these headlines that we don't, you don't think about when you're writing, but they, they're so powerful. So this word here on the second bullet point under 13, that second headline, 13 foolproof brain triggers. The word foolproof is the, uh, the driver here. So you could say, you know, 13 brain triggers that are awesome, but when I put the word foolproof in there that will increase, increase your conversion rate, that helps go against that idea that um, I have a fear of not doing the right thing. So that's very powerful. And then right above that, the word powerful is also another uh, key word. If you look on the left, the original example, um, a simple strategy to seduce readers and win clients, the words seduce and win are both um, really great words there. And then that starting it with a question, you know, no blog traffic, that as a natural, as a human, we become interested in solving and putting things together. There's actually a psychology all around this. But um, I guess the lesson here is just because one of your pieces of content does not perform as well as it should does not mean that you should say that that content did not work. So when you create clickable headlines, you know, through Twitter or Facebook, you can re-release an article multiple times and test multiple headlines to start to understand what people click into. And you're gonna probably have to put some, a little bit of paid, um, uh, like money behind it on the ads platform because if you only get let's say you know 50 people looking at your content and one person clicks in that's not really even enough data to make any decisions about so that's one caveat with testing a lot of this is you have to have enough traffic for it to actually draw conclusions and if it doesn't then you have to put some money behind it but we'll dig into that a little bit uh, in uh, toward the end here all right, um, the re-engage non-email opens. So um, real quick, uh, tap into everyone who's here, put in the chat pane, if anyone of you are using email marketing like a MailChimp right now to, uh, to market your business. Uh, MailChimp's a really great tool and uh, it's free up to, I think, 2,000 uh, emails. And I find that a lot of businesses will, uh, they will use it, but it's not necessarily the easiest thing uh, for them to do. Okay, so Swiss page, MailChimp, and constant contact. Um, even though we're showing a MailChimp example here, this, is, this probably applies based on most everybody that has a, an email marketing program out there. So this example is when I put together a, uh, a customized campaign based on what people did. Okay, only one release articles, okay. So over time, if you don't continue to re-engage people based on what they want, they eventually just grow stagnant. So when you're in MailChimp, what you can do to kind of get to get that list up and lively again is you can go into the list and then you can go into a segment. So you'd, you'd click on that segment over there, a new segment, and then it'll give you the opportunity to aggregate based on any of those variables there. So as you can see in this example, I just took it from a, a podcast campaign. Um, I can choose to send this email only to anybody who's opened any of the last campaigns. I could choose to send it to anybody who's opened a specific campaign. And what that does is it allows me to customize that message. So it might be, um, I could send a message to anybody who's opened the last of the five campaigns and say, 
Hey, loyal listener, thanks so much for getting, you know, buying into the show. As a special bonus for you, we'd love to have a chance for you to win a t-shirt. I know that the open rate on that is going to be much better and it's going to then help with engagement going forward. So this is an easy way to segment um, and do email marketing without having to go in and you know, do the personas and ask everybody what they're doing and how they interact. You can simply then create content campaigns that follows up with activity that had been on previous emails. Okay, another hack using that personalization or those personas, um, and these are a little bit blurry, I apologize, we just kind of grabbed them from LinkedIn, um, is to personalize ads based on industry or focus. So the example here, and I'll explain it since it's a little bit blurry, um, is going to be, so these are ads that ran on LinkedIn. And if you notice them, um, the, one of them at the top says, LinkedIn research reveals how marketers can leverage the latest techno technological advances to navigate the, the B2B buyer's journey. That ad probably appeared in people who do B2B marketing. Tech marketers, it's time to rethink the buyer's journey. All of these most likely lead to the same resource, but the copy that's in those ads is personalized based on the type of person that's seeing those ads. So for instance, on the bottom right, the financial services buyer's journey, that one is probably targeted to people in financial services, and you can do that on LinkedIn. Uh, you can do this type of thing on Facebook as well, and it just, it, it takes a little bit more time, but I'll tell you, it pays off much more than saying, hey, here's an article about the buyer's journey, click into this. Because no one really, we're just in a world now where everybody wants to feel like it's personalized to them, despite the fact that they're all mad that Facebook you know, knows everything about them. We still tooth, fight tooth and nail to make sure that uh, we have content that's made for us, so we're not wasting our time. Um, Problem-based copy, this is where those personas come in hardcore. So if you know the problems that I'm facing as a business owner, you can customize your ad so that it speaks directly to me and I can be like, oh, yeah, I have that problem. So these are two ads that I just pulled directly from my Facebook feed so you can tell that they're targeting me. Um, and I have, you know, ever wished running your business was a bit less time consuming? Ah, uh, yes, yes I do actually. Um, so that ad, you know, tame the chaos of running your business. As a business owner, if you don't feel chaos, um, you must have a secret that I don't know about. So um, that ad was very relevant. And then on FreshBooks, you know, make online accounting easy. Uh, for non-accountants, because me as a marketing professional, I would never call myself an accountant. So that all this copy is just a really good example of how to use problem-based copy. And again, if you don't have personas yet, do what I did and start just a file where you can just capture that stuff that you hear customers say uh, all the time, and then you'll be much better off in writing problem-based copy. Okay. So the second um, area here we're gonna focus on is leveraging those free or low cost tools uh, and systems. And when I say systems, I don't mean you know, huge project management systems or anything like that. I mean like the methodology in which you do your marketing. Because sometimes the having things that are easily deployed is half the battle. All right, I'm gonna grab a drink right here. Okay. Buffer to stay active. Um, any Buffer fans in the house? Um, chat in the pane, let me know if you use Buffer. Buffer is one of those tools that is free to use for one, um, uh, one profile, or if you have, I think it's up to three. Uh, any more than that, you need to pay for it. It's like $10 a month. But Buffer also have this thing called Pablo, which will allow you to create, and it integrates with Buffer, um, and you can create easy uh, images on top of social media. Uh, the reason why we suggest Buffer is there's a Chrome plugin that you can use for Buffer. And uh, you can basically schedule out all of your social and have it just appear that you're a lot more active maybe than you actually are. We find that we love, um, people will say like, Ali, you know, how are you and your team so active on LinkedIn? You know, we're not logging in every day and thinking about what should we say today. We're putting together a process so that we can go out and find relevant articles. So, you know, block 30 minutes once a month and go and find your own stuff, find, um, you know, partner type of content. Um, Buffer does automatically publish on Instagram now too, uh, for whoever said that. Um, they just released that and uh, they were a little bit behind. Sweet did it first. But Buffer did uh, did release that. So Emma just shared a link to Pablo, which is this that's showed here on the screen. 
They also come with images that you can use right out of the box or you can upload your own images. So again, they also have, as you can see in this screenshot, you can select the sizes that you're going to be using for. That's probably one of the biggest um, uh, benefits. And then would you also wanna share a link to the landscape um, tool? They also have a tool that helps you resize something for the different various uh, social media account. So Emma's gonna add that tool here in the chat pane so you could take a look at that. Um, and then after the webinar, we will send a link out uh, to all of these different resources that we're mentioning, uh, just so everyone can get those. Uh, so Sprout Social is the one that has that from, it's called Landscape and it'll, um, it'll resize that. Um, okay, so this is one of my favorite tools. This is like the one that makes me feel like a sneaky stalker, um, but it's, it's a good stalker. Um, you can get email addresses with a tool, a plugin called Hunter.io. So Hunter.io is a plugin that goes in the browser, um, in your Chrome, Google Chrome browser, and it will basically go out and look for email addresses associated with the domain that you're on. So I used our website as an example, and if you look, as I'm on the website, I click into the Hunter.io, you have to set up an account first, it's free, you get up to 100 requests a month, and as you can see, it looks and says, oh, you know what, based on this website, it looks like the way that they set up their emails are first, so first name, at simplestrut.com. So it's not 100% accurate, it's right there, if you, mine's a little bit clicked off, or clipped off, but it says, it's, it thinks Ali Schwanke's a fundraiser, which is funny. If anybody wants to give me money, <laughs> I, won't, I, won't, uh, I won't reject that. But um, it found Tyler's email address, it found Emma's email address, so this is nice because when we're doing outreach to let's say um, you know a business, and we're trying to find the sales director. There's a good chance I can find the sales director, his name on LinkedIn or her name, but I can't always find the email address on LinkedIn, and it's kind of spammy to reach out and, and you know send messages that way. So, but if I can track down their email address, then I have a much better chance to reach out. And with this Hunter.io extension, that's exactly what you can do. So, you know, if you add it to your leads, then you actually get a whole spreadsheet of these people. And this is how we do a lot of our business-to-business uh, -business, uh, research for email addresses. So check that out. Um, I, if you follow me at any, on anywhere, Twitter or LinkedIn or our company, you'll know that we're big fans of LinkedIn. And the reason why LinkedIn's becoming such a powerful tool is because I think social media has gotten a wrap of, you know, it's kind of noisy and it's easy to be overwhelmed and there's a lot of stuff there. LinkedIn is still a platform that's still pretty infant in terms of how people use it for business applications. So you do get one free month of LinkedIn Premium and what you can do with LinkedIn Premium is you can find out a lot more information about who's searching your profile. You have up to 15 free in-mail messages, which means that you can direct message someone and it actually looks like it comes through as an email to their inbox in their like Gmail or Outlook instead of coming through LinkedIn. And you get so many things that allow you to do so much research on the right person to talk to. And that's what a lot of marketing hacks come down to is having that, the conduit or the, 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 uh, the road that you need to get to to the right person in order for you to, to make that transaction. So if you haven't yet explored LinkedIn Premium, um, check that out because you do get a month free and I have a couple examples later on here that, that I'll show you some hacks with LinkedIn when we talk about like data. Um, adding an opt-in to your website. If you don't currently have an opt-in, this is a great way to get people onto your email list. And it's more than, I know a lot of people have like, sign up for our newsletter, you know, opt into our email campaign. I don't know about you guys, but the last time I went to a website, unless I was really, really interested in what they have to offer, if I'm just kind of browsing, I'm not going to sign up for their newsletter. So if you give me something of value that creates a compelling reason why, you're much more likely to get conversions on your homepage. So um, there's a little bit, there's a couple of tools mentioned later in this presentation that will show you exactly what tools you might use, but that's, that's a hack that if more business owners did that, so if you happen to be a, you know, a brick and mortar business um, and let's say you, you know, it's, it's not something you can say like 25% off, but if you're an um, electrical company and you say, you know, hey, here's the five um, you know, most common overlooked places that you might need uh, to have an electrical consultant come in and, uh, and look at your, your setup, um, that would be a good opportunity to do that as well. When you do create that opt-in, make sure that you send um, a welcome email that is fitting or a confirmation that's fitting for that. So I've seen a lot of companies that are like, yeah, I'm gonna do the opt-in, that's gonna be great, and we're gonna offer this free, this or that. And then like the name of their list is like this. Uh, thank you for confirming to upload on 9 10 15. 
okay, nothing says we didn't think about the customer experience or we value you basically not at all other than an email like this. So you want to make sure you test all of this through so that right here, what I should get is, you know, welcome aboard. It's so great to have you. We look forward to, you know, talking with you. Check out these resources. If you walked into a restaurant and they said, welcome to restaurant ABC and that's it, that's probably not the best experience. So think about this in terms of email as well because you want that to be a very positive experience. Another hack that these are things, again, these are things you can do for little to no cost. Um, we become, I put this example up here because when we shop on Amazon, we think, okay, who else here has had a good experience with this book or product or service? And again, Amazon just calls it out and says, here's 64 reviews and most of them have said four to five stars. So when you're thinking about ways that you can amplify your business, put together a list of customers that you can go out to and ask for reviews. Now I will say when you become a review ninja, this needs to become just something within your personality, within your process. So if you go out and ask for, let's say, you know, Ellie told me we need to get reviews, so we're gonna go ask 50 customers for those today. What's gonna happen if you do that all at once is, is Google or Facebook or whoever's gonna, gonna take those. You might end up getting some of them ghosted because they think reviews should be kind of an organic thing and they should be something that um, comes out and, and you, know, you have a big push for them once a year. They want to see them continually flow in as a stream of review content. So as you continually put those out every month, what I would suggest doing is every month, just put yourself, put, put to go, a goal together to get three reviews. And you might need to reach out to a couple before you get three reviews, but put a goal in place and that way every month you have a consistent stream of reviews. When it comes to local SEO, you will be blown away at the amount of of impact that regular reviews can have on your overall search performance. So again, it's a hack because it's little, but it takes some strategic effort to make sure you do it consistently. Um, this one's a little thing, but it's very important. Uh, your email signature is the thing that probably gets seen more than anything else in your entire marketing uh, toolkit. So make sure and use it to your advantage. So here I have an example where we put um, this badge that we're certified uh, HubSpot. So if you happen to be using HubSpot, if someone sees this, you know, oh, we're a HubSpot agency. Um, you know, if you have questions about that, you can feel free to, to reach out. But that, that alone um, is real estate that I think you should be using. And uh, take note now when you get emails from people if they're using that and creative ways to use that. If you use Gmail and you put a link to a YouTube video, it'll actually show up as a thumbnail um, that, that'll make people say, oh, what's that video? I should watch that. So don't underestimate the power of your email signature for your real estate. All right, another hack is to create secondary CTAs. Now a CTA is, is a call to action. And what that basically means is, let's say someone does opt in to you know, get a coupon on your website. So I visit the website for the first time. Let's say you sell candles. Hey, Ali, would you like 10% off your first order? Absolutely. I put in my email address. Instead of just going back to the homepage, it should send me to a page that says, oh, now that you have a coupon, here are the top 10 best sellers. You could probably find it. Um, so that would be really helpful for, your t for the customer experience. This is an example from Wishpond where they get an, you get an ebook. So it's like, hey, you wanted this ultimate guide to Google AdWords, here's the download. Oh, but if you wanna be able to put it into motion, why don't you just go ahead and create your free account? So again, this took a little bit of design work, but the secondary CTAs tend to convert better because the person's already bought into what you have to offer. Um, just real quick, addressing a question here. Novels are all about reviews and Amazon review, any book sites, how the people read my work, tell others looking to read it. Um, Annette, I'm not quite sure what you're asking for. Um, so maybe shoot, if you want to clarify and uh, we can get, it, get to it at the end, that would be great. Um, otherwise, we could also take that conversation offline too. Um, not just asking to comment about reviews. Okay, still not quite sure. Sorry about that. Um, we'll come back to that, okay, right at the end, Jeanette. Um, okay, so our hack here is you create systems for maximum output. So this is an example of, um, and some of you have done this incredibly well so I applaud you if you are doing this but you know there's still a lot of research that needs to go into the top hashtags that you should be using to gain visibility on Instagram and I've noticed that um, you know it's a good thought it's just putting this in practice so this example here where they have a set of hashtags that they just add as a comment to every single Instagram post this creates a no-brainer type of situation for you to be able to post and get it in front of the most amount of people 
So that's one example of a system that you can do to get more output. Here's another system. If you put together descriptions of your company that can be easily deployed to websites or review sites or you know, PR, we have what we call a messaging guide internally at Simple Strat, and we build this for clients too. When you have a messaging guide, you know exactly what's going to be featured in what description on what website. So that way, let's say there's, uh, you know, you're going to set up a YouTube channel. What typically happens is, hey, we should set up a YouTube channel. And then it's like, what is what goes in the description? Uh, and each time you kind of make up something different. So if you have this uh, vetted in advance, you can easily then set up new systems and, and deploy those rather easily. Um, and then it's less uh, worry about what you're going to say and more about actually executing on that marketing tactic. All right, another uh, hack here is to use video to track engagement. Now, at Market Tech, we talked a ton about video. Uh, and if you follow us at all on Instagram or Facebook or pretty much any, any platform, um, we love using video because it's one of the things that um, I think since about probably 2013, everyone's like, it's the year of video. Um, and now with the smartphones being where they are, everyone's creating so much video content, which is great because you can all hit record and record video in a matter of seconds. However, because everyone can now record video, there's, a, there's definitely a race to create video that, that performs and actually helps you reach your goal. So it's no longer like a novelty to just have video. So if you use a tool, this tool here that I'm showing is actually um, this one. I think it's free for the first three uh, videos you host on it. It's called Wistia. And if you want to throw that in the chat pane. Um, it's called Wistia and I can see, so this is an example from there. This isn't one of our videos. This is just an example. Uh, but you can see that there is an average engagement rate of 50%, 453 total plays, um, 7% play rate. All of those things allow us to make better decisions. So you can see that I probably, if I'm going to get a really good hook for someone to stay engaged in the video, I got to get it in the first six seconds. So this helps the, I've noticed sometimes when, uh, even like if you go to YouTube and I type in like how to use Buffer, for example, how to use Buffer. If I go to link or if I go to YouTube in the first like 60 seconds of the YouTube video, the guy talks about like who he is and, and why he should be showing you how to use Buffer. I mean, forget that. People just want to know how to use Buffer. So you got to get into it right away. If you want to get your branding on that video and you want to get some credibility on the video, get your logo and why you're, you're credible in the first three seconds and then go right into the content. So this, when you use video to track engagement, um, you can put it onto a web page, and when a video is on there, it also um, leads to longer dwell time. So if you're not tracking engagement, you should be. Um, this is a hack that I've noticed uh, working really well with um, companies that have been, like let's say you're a one or two person company. At the bottom I have an example of the Subaru Ascent, which I own a Subaru and there's a whole different story on why I own a Subaru that I'll have to tell you about sometime that involves a drive from Alaska to Nebraska. But um, this email, like I get it from Subaru, I'm a Subaru owner and I actually expect to get emails from Subaru because I bought a Subaru. But when it's coming from a company that's supposed to have like a one-to-one -one approach, when it comes from a person, it's much more likely to be open. So look at the examples I have there. I have Ruben from BidSketch and Rachel from Vocal. Again, that gives me the idea that it's coming from a person rather than a company. And you'll notice that if you start doing and testing, you'll most likely see a higher open rate when it comes from a person than you will when it comes from uh, a, a company. So give that a shot. And this is another example from the tool Wistia. Actually, um, Wistia, on their paid versions, you can do this. So this one actually does require some money, uh, but you can put opt-ins and calls to action on a video. So if this video was embedded in my website, I can actually make it so that they have to sign up to join the email list or get a coupon or something in order to watch the rest of the video. Um, they can always skip it. You could choose if they can skip it, which on this example, they show that you can skip it. Um, but you can see then on the heat maps that are below this, that even like Leo at the greatest.com, he had submitted on the turnstile and that's, that's what this is called as a turnstile. If you use a, a tool called soapbox, which I'll, there's another example we have in here in a little bit about soapbox that, uh, you can actually add a call to action at the end. So if I'm out selling to, let's say a business owner and I say, you know, based on all this information I showed you about HubSpot, are you interested in a demo? If so, click here. So that gives me a chance to sell from video, which is just a new and exciting thing um, that again, if, you're, if your company is using video, you should be looking at tools like this to maximize your lead generation uh, and engagement. 
All right, this one is our one of our favorite hacks, um, and it's a contest. So I've noticed a lot of companies that they've, you know, they want to do comment to enter to win, or share to enter to win, or like to win. And the the good thing about that is it it feels like a really good thing at the time. You get a lot of um, insight on, oh great, we, you know, we had seventy five hundred more views on our Facebook page this month. But what I'm concerned with as a marketer is making sure those people convert into customers. So when you run a contest, if you can use a tool like Viper or Wishpond is another platform that you could use, um, you get them to opt in and do it with email capture. So if you look into Viper, I don't have all the examples in this because we don't have time for it, but if you use a tool like Viper, um, when, it, when you click on yes, sign me up, what it will do is it'll say, go ahead and sign up with your email, and then it will take them to a screen that says, hey, would you like to get 10 more entries? Great, follow us on Facebook. And then it'll take them to Facebook and verify that. Would you like to get five more entries? Follow us on Instagram. So you can build in additional, and as a human, you're like, yeah, I want 10 more entries for something as simple as following them on Facebook. So you can do that, and if you pay for the tool um, like at the next level, above the basic level, um, you can then have them do custom things like if you want them to visit a certain page on your website, they have to click over to do that. So this is, um, we did this with a business in, was it Hastings? With a business in Hastings, and uh, they got um, like 900 emails out of one contest um, that they added to their email list as a result of using this tool. So um, give it a shot, this is a really powerful one that I'd, I'd like to have everyone kind of check out. Um, quizzes are another great opportunity to generate leads. So this is an example of how you'd use a quiz at each stage of the buyer's journey. And the buyer's journey is what we use to talk to people about taking them from people have no idea that you exist to, wow, should I work with you today or tomorrow? Um, so the awareness stage, you know, if you ask some questions about, so again, if I go back to that candle company, the quiz might be, uh, you know, what kind of candle scent are you? Um, or what kind of, uh, you know, a home decorator are you and so you get information from there that then at the end of the quiz you could offer them you know a coupon or, or something or you know sign up for email list to get a free sample um, the consideration stage is going to be that like they now know that they want to use candles to increase their serenity within their home and so they're trying to figure out like what type of candle they need do they want a long burning candle or a short burning or do they want you know uh, candlesticks or do they want uh, you know whatever that happens to be and then the decision stage is, you know, what, what kind should they buy? So the decision stage might be um, asking someone if, uh, take this quiz to find out if you're a good candidate for our quick ship program. So the, the quiz is, there's a tool called Try Interact, which again, will get out to you on all those links that you can use the quiz tool actually for free and, and try it out. And then this one seems to be, um, it's not really a hack, it's just a, it's a thing that people forget. Um, when you create something and you have uh, content that you think is really great, send out a message and ask for people to share it. And this is an example. We created a video called We Are Simple Strat, and we featured a lot of people in our video. And when the video launched for about seven days, every day I sent a message out to five to ten people and said this very same thing. We just created a video about Simple Strat, you know, someone that we worked with, did you mind sharing this video? And in doing this, we got 3,500 views on the video within the first week without putting any advertising behind it, which is pretty incredible. So um, I would highly encourage you to think about asking people to help uh, share into your content. And then this is that content upgrade to add to your blog. These three tools here, Sumo, Lead Pages, and Beacon, are all a way you can create content upgrades, which are basically like a downloadable resource uh, on your website. Okay, so focus area three are the analytics. And again, not, we're not gonna go too in depth here, but um, talk through the review and act on video analytics. So again, back to this initial screen grab here, why are they dropping off? So if you can start to figure that out and look at user behavior, um, you'll start to say, how can we create better video content? And another example of that is this here, where on Wistia, I get average engagement rate. This is actually a video that we have on our site. Um, I can see that um, you know, 83, 85% of the people are engaged, seven people took action. So you can see on the right-hand side here that two of them clicked annotation, which annotation is like a link that if Brandon on this video talked about like, hey, go check out how to create a sell sheet, and we have a link to that blog post in the video, two people clicked on that. So this, all of this information is what you need to be looking at once you start creating video content, because more is not better, effective is better, and that's what you need to be doing with your video content. 
Um, so this is an example of testing social engagement. And this is that LinkedIn that I was telling you about. So on the left-hand side, you'll see that this video is a square video. And I used captions to put this video out. And the title of this is differentiating your business. But then on the bottom is where the captions run. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that I have the metrics of everybody that's interacted with that video. So what I can do with this is I can test, and at the top you can see I had one comment, 23 likes, and about 1,800 views. Or sorry, 1,018 views. Um, I can now test this if I keep track of the engagement. I'm gonna release the same type of video with a different format and see how people engage with that. I can test different times a day. If I have all this information over here about UNL, Vistage, Quinn Global, I can then say, hmm, who inside those organizations do I know that I could reach out to in order to prospect that company? So again, powerful, powerful stuff. Um, study the Google ad results. If you don't currently know that a Google ad is a great way to find out what, what your competitors spent money on to find out what works, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm talking about. So if you go to Google ads and if I'm, again, selling candles and I type in candles uh, for mom for Mother's Day, there's a good chance you're gonna be able to find what Yankee Candle has figured out what works for Google ads and you can use that same language. So if I'm selling a CRM and these are the Google ads that show up, there's a good chance that I'm gonna find some gold in these Google ad results that are gonna help me write better copy for all of my stuff. Don't ever forget that they're paying to be in front of them and you're not, so that's great. Um, showcase user generated social proof. You'll find that um, if you go to a website now and you just have someone say, uh, you know, how many testimonials do you have? Well, I can make up testimonials. You can't make up things like Twitter um, or tweets. And by embedding them in this website, you can actually then track click-throughs about who goes and sees who these companies are. So that, um, that does a lot to help support your case. So we're getting toward the end here. I just wanted to offer a few uh, free resources. We have a whole page of resources on our website uh, that range from marketing plans to how to use social media in your company. Um, there's like probably what, nine or 10 there. And then we have a ton of stuff on our blog. So feel free to head over there and uh, grab some of those resources and then um, you know, ask any questions. Um, we're gonna open it up to comments or questions right now. Um, so we have about, uh, looks like a little over four minutes left and then Heidi's got some stuff to wrap up. So um, that's, that's what we have for you today. If any of those hacks, um, hopefully you found one or two things in there that you can, you can dig into and apply. Otherwise, um, you know, Heidi, I'll turn it back over to you if you want to uh, dig into some questions. Yeah, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Allie. So, and I did, I did tweet a couple of your suggestions, so I thought they were pretty, pretty darn good. Uh -huh. um, all right, so we're going to open it up for questions. I'm going to uh, unmute the people on, who are on the phone. Uh, everybody else, if you could... Uh, type in the chat box that we don't have people talking over one another. That would be great. All right, and Casey says, thanks, Allie. Um, I can just jump back up. So there was a couple, there was a question about uh, creating YouTube videos has been a challenge. Um, if Carrie uh, is still on here, um, I guess I'll talk a little bit about Adobe Spark on your computer. So depending on the types of videos you're creating, um, I know a lot of people will have the, um, you know, they'll, they'll think they have to go all out and use, you know, all the different types of software, you know, Adobe, Adobe Spark is free. But I would say that the, the biggest thing that influences editing time is knowing exactly what you wanted to create before you actually create the video. So, um, you know, when I was presenting this type of content at a conference in Chicago, someone's question was, uh, what's the best, you know, what are the best tips for editing video? And, and the, the tip was take a class or, or learn more about um, storyboarding because once you identify the content you want to capture, the editing process becomes a lot more clear. And if there's some things like maybe you're editing out, um, you know, pauses and ums and ahs or things like that, um, be willing to embrace the authentic and raw nature of some of the video if it happens to be, you know, thought leadership kind of stuff. If it's product videos, you, you definitely don't want to have those, those uh, you know, glaring flaws in there. But uh, as far as Adobe Spark, if you have specific questions about that, um, Carrie, feel free to reach out to our team. Uh, we do a lot with Adobe Spark and there might be some specific questions we can answer for you. 
Um, a few others here, the best option for social media ads, boosting posts, campaigns, best audience. So social media ads are, uh, are excellent and we definitely believe, um, we, we strongly believe that Facebook organic is dead. Um, and despite everyone's, you know, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see some engagement. It's just for the, the amount of time you put into Facebook organic, most times it's hard to get a return that's worth your, with your effort, efforts when you don't put money behind it. But by and large, the biggest reason why social media ads aren't as effective as they could be is you don't know enough about your audience. So instead of saying, I'm going to target all women who are, you know, age 30 to 40 in, in Nebraska, a better thing is to say, okay, if I sell candles, what other types of pages might my audience follow that would make sense? So if I tend to be a person who burns organic candles, there's also a good chance that I recycle and there's also a good chance that I garden. And so all of that or visit, you know, farmers markets, all of that then becomes the pages that you would identify as the pages that your audience follows. And then you target your campaign more on likes of those pages than you do on the demographics of, you know, women 30 to 40. So uh, that's kind of how that, that works. And when you're just getting started, just getting sorry, is someone else there? No. Okay. Um, when, when you look at uh, targeting on social media too, um, you're not going to be able to find out much about your audience's interaction with an ad unless you're spending about $50 a day. Um, up until then, you just don't really have enough uh, data to make any big correlations. So if your budget is like 100 bucks a month, you're just not going to know enough about how people engage with your audience to really make any big changes. And Allie, would you like to talk a little bit more too about uh, Instagram? Yeah. Um, so Instagram. So one of the things that comes up is you know people will say, "Look, well, should I be on Instagram?" Um, Instagram is a, a very powerful platform, and I would say for a lot of the grown Nebraska members that have more of a B two C type of business, like you have a product that you're that you're selling, or it's an e commerce. Um, I know there's, there's a lot that are still being to be in Grow Nebraska, but um, the most powerful aspect of Instagram as it relates now is the ability for you to publish stories. And stories are very challenging. It's funny, one of our, in our Slack channel, our, our uh, video production manager just posted something literally about that about five minutes ago. Um, but the stories allow you to use a location hashtag, which then gets anywhere from three to five times more views on your story because it goes out publicly than it does uh, just if you, if you go to your fan base, which building an Instagram following is, is challenging in and of itself. Uh, the schedulers that work for Instagram, because staying on top of that's you know, a challenge. Uh, you could use Hootsuite, which is one that uh, I think it's $10 a month to use Hootsuite. Um, if you, you wanna have multiple people working on it, if it's just you and your account, uh, Hootsuite's free. And you can schedule stories as well as Instagram posts. So I would definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, the other thing that I would encourage people to do with Instagram is do some Instagram mining. So figure out who your best, inter like people who interact with your brand are, and then interact with them. Comment on their posts. Encourage them to share. Direct message. Um, direct messages, if they're open, are still one of the biggest underutilized opportunities in Instagram because people aren't using it as much as they do um, a posting platform. But it, you can have conversations, and I'd encourage you to, to look at that. Awesome. Well, it is one o'clock here, so I am going to seal the screen back, uh, Allie. Sure. Um, but again, if you do have any other questions for Allie, I am sending out a follow-up email with her contact information. Um, real quick, just some housekeeping things before you hop off for the day. Grow Nebraska does have a special offer for new members. So if you have not been a member of Grow Nebraska before and you have less than five employees, we are now, we now have a special deal only good until May 31st where you can get two years of membership for the price of one. Our next Thursday, third Thursday training is going to be on getting export ready. So if you have uh, product that you are interested in exporting, this would be a great training to be on. We're bringing in Dennis Lynch from uh, Food Export of the Midwest, but he can help you out with all kinds of products. Uh, for members, don't forget we do have a first Friday chat, the first Friday of every month. We have a member uh, training session 
that you can register for. It's also a webinar. And on June 26, we are going to have a Get Your Business Online with Google training. Uh, so we're bringing in Paige Cahill, who is a national Google trainer, and she will be talking about how you can share your story through video. And save the date for the next Market Tech Conference. We had a great time with Allie this last year. Uh, but Market Tech 2019 is going to be April 3rd. So that is all of my news. Thank you, everyone, for sticking around. And thank you so much, Allie, for such wonderful information. This was an amazing training. So also another shout out quick to the Nebraska Department of Economic Development for being our sponsor today. Hope everyone has a great day.